Well, hello everyone and welcome to a conversation between Professor David Chalmers and Swami Savapriyananda on Reality Plus, Ancient and Modern Perspectives on Consciousness. Professor Chalmers is familiar to our audience since Swamiji has referenced him many times as the renowned philosopher who formulated the hard problem of consciousness. We are so happy that we can now welcome him in person today. In attempting to construct a short bio to introduce Professor Chalmers, I was challenged by discovering that his CV is almost the length of a small book. So here is a very abridged story of Professor Chalmers, a philosopher and cognitive scientist specializing in the areas of philosophy of mind and language. Professor Chalmers is professor of philosophy and neural science at New York University and co-director of NYU Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness. He was born in Australia, attended the University of Adelaide and from there, Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, where he explains his little obsession with the problem of consciousness spun out of control. From Oxford, he moved to the US and obtained his PhD in philosophy and cognitive science at Indiana University. After professorships at various other universities in the US, in 2004, he returned to teach at the Australian National University and five years later, moved to New York City where he now resides, as well as the Hudson Valley. He has co-founded the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, the Phil Papers Foundation, and three other centers for consciousness. He is also a fellow of the American Arts and Sciences and fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities. Apart from innumerable papers and articles on consciousness, philosophy, metaphysics, cognitive science, and more, he has edited several books and is the author of four books. The Conscious Mind, The Character of Consciousness, Constructing the World, and his most recent book published this year, Reality Plus. And here it is. I hope everybody can see it. There's much more, but we really want to hear from the man himself. So on behalf of us all, Professor Chalmers, may I offer a very warm welcome to you. Well, thank you so much. It's such a, uh, such a pleasure to be here uh, talking to you all. Um, you know, Swami and I know each other from, uh, from around New York University, where we've, uh, we've been to many events. Um, we have events on consciousness and from a philosophical philosophical perspective, from a scientific perspective, from a first person and third person perspective, we've had many interactions there. But I'm really pleased to have today the, this chance to have a conversation about uh, about you know different philosophical approaches to consciousness in from many different uh, philosophical traditions. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Diane. Uh, before we get into the discussion itself, I think. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things in addition to what Diane said from a very personal perspective. Um, I think one of the great things that uh, Professor Chalmers has done is uh, he has been an advocate for you know, philosophy for everybody. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it so happens like some, some other disciplines, philosophy also becomes after a sub certain time, uh, you know, limited to a group of academicians and then the general public lose interest in it. Luckily, in physics, for example, we have had some wonderful popularizers of, of um, physics, uh, starting with Stephen Hawking, and we have Brian Green right here in Columbia University. I think Professor Chalmers is doing uh, that for philosophy, especially the way he lectures his TED Talks, for example, and this particular book, uh, Reality Plus. So it's going to create a lot of, it is already creating a lot of popular interest in, in uh, philosophy, and that's wonderful. The second thing, which I want to uh, just touch upon before we get into it, is this, um, uh, you know, the dialogue between Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy, if you will. Uh, Professor Chalmers, I don't know, he's right here, so I don't want to say it to his face, but he is 
he's always described as one of the leading philosophers of mind. And if you ever you know, talk about consciousness, consciousness studies, especially the hard problem of consciousness, his name will always be there. If you look up you know, like the top 10 living philosophers in the world today, his name will always be, be there. Um, but also, uh, he is open to multiple perspectives on consciousness uh, studies. Um, this book, particularly, uh, Reality Plus, I, here is my copy, and I'm uh, thoroughly <laughs> enjoying reading it. Um, this book, I, I was uh, uh, very happy to see that there are uh, inputs from, uh, from uh, Advaita, from Sankhya, from Buddhist philosophy, from the Islamic philosopher Al-Ghazali, as well as the ancient Greek philosophers. You have uh, Vishnu and Narada here discussing the problem of Maya. Uh, you have Na the great ph Buddhist philosophers, Nagarjuna, uh, Vasubandhu. And so I always felt that uh, there could be a very profitable dialogue between uh, modern philosophy, modern Western philosophy, and the insights from uh, ancient Indian philosophy and world philosophy on the very pertinent and important uh, issues of consciousness studies. And this is what I see. I mean, I'd expected a little bit of that, but I see that throughout this book, you know, almost every chapter has inputs from world philosophy. So thank you very much for that, Professor. Um, in this book, um, I, I was just noticing that he talks about, Professor Chalmers talks about um, whether the world is real, the old philosophical problem of the reality of the world, um, uh, what, what we can know about the world, the problems of consciousness and knowledge, what is real, and how, what is the criterion of reality, and then finally, what is the point of it all, I and mean, what is the purpose of all of philosophy and life itself, and I couldn't help thinking, and especially it will be relevant to this audience, the, the terms existence or reality, consciousness, and um, you know, fulfillment in life, they correspond almost exactly to Sat, Chit, and Ananda, uh, existence, consciousness, and bliss, uh, which is uh, the central theme of Advaita Vedanta, which is what we have been discussing in our groups forever. Um, in retrospect, it's not, not, not such a big deal because I think that's all that philosophy is about. Philosophy is about metaphysics, it's about epistemology and what's called axiology, the, you know, the theory of, of values. But what Professor Chalmers has done is he has brought in an entirely new angle, the angle of uh, what he calls techno-philosophy and given new insights into age-old problems. So that's what we are going to discuss today the new insights he has got into uh, existence, into um, consciousness, and into the, you know, the whole point of it, the purpose of life, and uh, the relationship with Eastern philosophy, especially with Advaita Vedanta. So um, I was thinking maybe we could start, maybe I could ask you, Professor, uh, what is techno-philosophy? And... Uh, how did you come to this? You know, you've been, always been interested in consciousness studies and the philosophy of mind, but why techno-philosophy? And uh, what are the new insights that we are getting from techno-philosophy? Uh, techno-philosophy, I see as a two-way interaction between philosophy and technology. So partly it's thinking philosophically about technology, taking new technologies like artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and say, okay, what does this mean? Uh, what can we know? What kinds of realities will these create? And a good amount of this book is about that. But what's really distinctive of techno-philosophy is that you can also take attention to philosophy, sorry, you can pay attention to technology, and this will then shed light in turn on philosophical questions. So I find, you know, actually thinking about computers uh, can shed light in some ways on thinking about artificial intelligence, for example, can sometimes shed light on philosophical questions about the human mind, or in this case, thinking about virtual reality can shed light on philosophical questions about reality. And maybe that's a core theme of this book in particular, Reality Plus. Pay attention to virtual reality, 
not just because it's interesting in its own right, it is, but I think actually thinking about virtual reality can help us make sense of ordinary reality, whether that's physical reality, virtual reality, or something else. So that's the theme I really try and pursue in this book. I'm actually inspired by the uh, Canadian American philosopher, Patricia Churchland, who back in the 1980s talked about neuro philosophy, which was similarly philosophy sheds light on neuroscience, neuroscience sheds light on philosophy. I disagree with many of Churchland's particular philosophical claims. She's very reductionist about consciousness, whereas I am not. But I find that program inspiring and techno philosophy is meant to uh, is meant to yeah, pick up on a, on a similar spirit, but on technology. I mean, one, ask, one way this comes out is in the, the whole hypothesis, for example, that reality might itself be, our reality might be a virtual reality, that physical reality might be some kind of, uh, some kind of simulation. This is the so-called simulation hypothesis, which many people think if reality is a simulation, then none of it is real. Whereas I try to argue that even if we are in a, uh, in a computer simulation, things still are real. I'm still living in a, uh, living in a world of, you know, there are still tables and chairs, there are still people, there are still planets. I may not be in touch, on the other hand, with ultimate reality um, if, if we're in a simulation. But I, th I want to argue we're at least still in touch with some level of uh, of reality in a way i think this whole idea then bears stands in an interesting relationship to uh yeah the relationship between appearance and reality in indian philosophy and in many other philosophical traditions but i'm just trying to come at some of those questions about appearance and reality through this distinctive lens of technology because i think yeah once you acknowledge that physical reality is perhaps a little like virtual reality well that helps us to understand virtual reality but also helps us to understand physical reality i think that is one of the major themes of your book how um, you take up virtual reality which almost everybody thinks of as appearance uh, illusory not real and then you begin to show in what sense it could be real before we get into that you do a great job of summarizing the criteria of reality the five criteria of uh, of reality I'll just talk a little bit about that and we can take it from there. Um, in this book, uh, Professor Chalmers um, says that, first of all, we need to know what is reality. When we talk about reality, how do you define reality? So straight off, one of the, one of the ways is uh, that if you can see something, it's real. Uh, if you, um, you, know, you, can, you can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it, it's an object to our senses, it's real. Or a little more scientifically, if you can measure something, it's real. Uh, and so that's one criteria. And um, before we go into the other, when I read that, I was thinking, you know, in Advaita Vedanta, this would exactly be the definition of unreality. I mean, quite <laughs> radically, but uh, we might exactly be talking about the same thing because Advaita Vedanta says the moment you say something is an object to the senses, then it's an object to consciousness. And in that sense, not as real as consciousness itself. Or if something is measurable, then it's finite, and therefore it won't be the infinite, you know, all-pervasive being, existence, and so on. In that sense, not ultimately real, but definitely transactionally real. The second criterion of reality, another way of understanding reality would be um, causality. You know, if things can do something, they are real. So um, I'm thirsty, and I can drink a glass of water, and it quenches my thirst, then the water is real. And I found this fascinating because this is an ancient, ancient theory of reality in India. Uh, it's called uh, Artha Kriya Karitvam, which means practical efficacy. And this was the criterion of reality used by the Buddhists. Uh, and uh, I want to offer uh, you know, the Advaita counterpoint to that, which is related to virtual reality also. What the Advaitins would say to the Buddhist would be, you know, you could drink a glass of water and it would quench your thirst. And the next moment you could wake up and say that, oh, it was all a dream. In that case, even causality wouldn't have shown you that it was not real. The third criterion, 
and uh, you, is non-illusoriness. And this actually is the Advaita Vedanta criterion for reality. The Advaita Vedanta would say that if some, uh, an illusion is that which is negated, and if you, get, if you can, in principle, say that, oh, it's false, and this was not real, it was a dream, it was an error, or it was a virtual reality, I have now come out of it, I'm in the truth now, I've woken up. In that case, that earlier experience was not real. Um, so if it's negatable by this kind of experience, that it's not real, then it's illusion. So something that cannot be negated. Um, so here's uh, another question. I'll come back, I'll sum, up, sum it all up in the end, but um, you know, you, quite, uh, you quote Cornel West, that it could be illusions all the way down. But would you agree that with the Advaitin, that there is one thing that cannot be illusion on this criterion of reality, and that's consciousness itself, because that's the one which judges whether it's an illusion or not an illusion. It's to consciousness that the illusoriness are, um, has to be proved of, uh, of an unreal, um, you know, of a simulation or whatever. And then, of course, uh, you go on to two more criteria of reality. One would be, I think, from Austin, that is the genuineness versus the fakeness of something. Um, but I think this is a lot to be uh, going on with. Would you, uh, and it's, it's a personal interest, and I think for everybody here in this audience, would consciousness pass muster as, uh, you know, as being the foundation, you know, from which you can judge illusory or non-illusory, and by the criterion of uh, non-illusoriness, would consciousness be reality? And what would techno philosophy say about this? What would techno philosophy say, for example, about um, measurability or seeability as a criterion of falsity um, and not as reality? Um, and about practical efficacy, like you can things work in a video game, but when we come out of the video game, we say that we don't say that was real. Um, I don't know, what, what's your take on all this? Yeah, that's extremely interesting. Um, yeah, the Advaita take on these different notions of reality. And I guess I'm sympathetic with what you say in that I think the most important criterion of reality is perhaps non-illusoriness. And that's the one that I end up putting the most attention on in the uh, book, arguing that virtual reality can be real, for example, in the sense of not being illusory or no more illusory than physical reality. But I completely agree about consciousness. I mean, it's been absolutely central to my work on consciousness, that consciousness is real and it's not an illusion. I mean, this goes way back. I mean, this is so central to so many traditions in Western philosophy, at least in modern Western philosophy. The classic statement comes from Rene Descartes saying, well, I think, therefore I am. It's like, I can doubt the external world, but I can't doubt my thinking, my consciousness, and, uh, Therefore, this, this is not an illusion. This is not real. This is real. Um, and I'm very sympathetic with that. I mean, there is, in recent philosophy, a quite important line that tries to extend the idea of illusion to consciousness and says consciousness itself may be an illusion. The, someone like Daniel Dennett sometimes puts his view, at least ext an extreme version of his view, by saying, you know, we're not really conscious. We're all zombies beings without consciousness we just think we have these special properties of consciousness that's an illusion i actually find that view fascinating but i can't agree with it i mean for me consciousness is a is a datum and it's fundamentally real and so I, i'm prepared to put that at the epistemological foundation that uh, that consciousness is real but i'm also interested this book is you know, a lot of my past work has been about consciousness and its reality in this book, I'm trying to get, yeah, consciousness is a focus, but I'm also especially interested in the world beyond consciousness and whether that is real. I mean, if you're a Cartesian, you might think, okay, consciousness is real, but the world beyond, uh, the world beyond is not. And you know, I know that plays a role in many Eastern traditions as well. What I'm trying to argue is that uh, some aspects of the external world may also be real. So reality includes consciousness, isn't necessarily limited to consciousness. Um, you know, in if physical reality, my view is that physical reality is something, well, I want to say it's at least something beyond my consciousness. There's my consciousness, there's a world beyond my physical reality, 
sorry, that will be on my consciousness that affects my consciousness. And I want to say that world, those aspects of the world are real too. Of course, saying that still leaves open what their nature is. Yeah. It could be a physical world out there. It could be a virtual world out there, or it could be a world of consciousness out there. So um, everything I say is consistent with the idea that everything is consciousness. There's my consciousness and there's a world out there which is more consciousness. Um, but it's also consistent with the idea that it might be a physical world out there, which is something beyond my consciousness. So I guess what I'd say is, yes, consciousness is absolutely real. Is consciousness all of reality? However, well, it could be if these certain idealist views are true that say all of external reality is just more consciousness. I'm at least I'm interested in that idea, but I'm not. Uh, I'm also open to the idea that external reality could have a nature which is not consciousness. Maybe it's physics. Maybe it's digital. I talk about the it from bit view in the book. In the in the book, the idea that reality is made of uh, of bits and. and I actually, well, if you want to throw that into a consciousness framework, we can then combine that with what I call the it from bit from consciousness view, that the bits themselves are grounded in consciousness, if that's the view you like to take. But I'm somewhat neutral on the fundamental physics of the external world here. So um, the consciousness absolutely is real. That's so fascinating. And there's so much packed into that. Uh, but let, let, before I forget, you've just given me an idea for, a, you know, thinking about a new topic and a new talk, which I'm going to call, uh, taking up from you, it from bit. Um, I'm going to call it it from chit. This is the, the C-H-I-T, that's the Sanskrit for consciousness. Fantastic. Um, right. What Professor Chalmers is talking about is, um, uh, here in this book, he mentions how there's a new discussion in, in, in particle physics about you know, the tables made of molecules and molecules of atoms, atoms of subatomic particles down to quarks, maybe even super strings. And that somehow, I don't understand the physics of it at all, but that somehow is uh, made of, um, of bits, that means of information. And as Professor just said, an information could be grounded in consciousness. So the entire uh, universe could be an appearance of consciousness that's really bears thinking about. But tracing it back a little bit to what where you started off, uh, with Patricia Churchill and just uh, it reminded me uh, I was at this philosophy of mind course at Harvard University a couple of years back and uh, the textbook was one of the books edited by Professor Chalmers and <laughs> literally he wrote the book on the philosophy of mind uh, which is now being used by the leading universities uh, of the world and Patricia uh, Churchill's I think one of her essays was included there and I think there was quite an interesting debate in the classroom uh, between Patricia Churchland's uh, reductionist views and Professor Chalmers' uh, views on, on consciousness studies. So it's it's kind of the state of the art debate uh, in the world of philosophy of mind now. You mentioned Descartes. So let's just focus it on Descartes. The, the uh, sense I got while studying the philosophy of mind was the last person who said something revolutionary and very interesting in this field was Descartes 300 years ago. And, and I actually wrote this in, in an assignment in, at, at Harvard that from Descartes to Professor Chalmers, in between all of it has been basically a group of um, you know, people trying to reduce consciousness and mind to matter, to brain, to neurons, to behavior, to language. And another group of philosophers saying, look, guys, it doesn't work. Like your colleague at, at uh, NYU, Thomas Nagel, what is it like to be a bat? Or, um, uh, or, or Professor Jackson, I think he's also Australian, uh, mm -hmm. who writes about Mary, who's never seen the color red. Uh, and, and all of this, so two groups of philosophers of mind, one group saying that we have to reduce mind and consciousness to brain or language or behavior. And another group saying it can't be done until you come along and you formulate this whole thing in terms of the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, by the way, I love it when you say in the book, you know, Descartes cogito or gusum, I think, therefore I am. You make it sharper. You, you say, uh, I'm conscious, therefore I am. And thinking comes a little bit after consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us, what was Descartes' contribution 
and what were the problems like interactionism which arose out of it and the insights you get from neuro uh, from uh, you know uh, techno philosophy uh, which can actually solve the problem of the Descartian duality. Yeah, well, I think you're giving me a little bit too much uh, too much credit here. I think there've been many wonderful, many wonderful philosophers along the way in the centuries since Descartes. I, you, it's certainly true there's a lot of people, reductionism about consciousness, non-reductionism about consciousness. But I also think of somebody like, say, William James, whose co contribution was to the phenomenology of consciousness primarily, but he founded the much of the psychology of consciousness has been very influential in the 20th century. He didn't try to reduce consciousness to something uh, to something material, but he just approached it phenomenologically and gave something, gave science something to be going along with. I mean, along the way, there have been so many fascinating ideas about consciousness, Barclay's idealism, um, Bertrand Russell's monism, but yeah, but Descartes is uh, is what you're asking about. Um, you know, Descartes was really, he had so many seminal contributions to the modern Western traditions, of course, many of which have, um, have predecessors in much more ancient traditions. First of all, his arguments for, you know, doubting the external world. And here he's follow, he follows many great ancient philosophers and say, how do I know reality is not an illusion. How do I know I'm not dreaming? Um, how do I know an evil demon isn't fooling me? Um, but then he says, well, there's one thing I'm sure of, one thing, maybe I can doubt the external world, but I always know that I am here doubting. And as you say, fundamentally, I am here conscious. Scholars tell me that when Descartes uses this word cogito, he always means conscious. It includes conscious sensation, for example. You and I might think that's prior to thought. But when he says, I think, he really means I am conscious in this broader sense. And then when he does this, you know, he says, I am essentially, he says, a thing that thinks, by which he means I am essentially a conscious thing. My body is not essentially a conscious thing, he says, but I am essentially a conscious thing. And he argues that the mind can't be reduced to the body. I could you could have consciousness without a body. Maybe you could have a body without consciousness. He argues these are two separate things. So this is one of the great statements of the philosophical view of dualism, which is mind and matter are both real, but they're distinct from each other. And Descartes believed in both the realm of consciousness and the physical realm. The big problem, dualism has been, was a popular view for centuries. The big problem for it has always been the problem of interaction. How do these two realms interact? Um, you know, Descartes himself thought maybe it happens through a certain part of the brain, the pineal gland uh, between the cerebral hemispheres. Okay, that view is not proved to be uh, vindicated by science at all, so no one believes that anymore. But it turns out to be a very difficult issue, um, especially in light of modern physics. So some people say consciousness is independent, doesn't affect the physical world, whereas other people try and find a role for consciousness in the physical world. I mean, I've actually myself, I'm interested in all these views. So recently I wrote a long article on consciousness and quantum mechanics to try and at least pursue one possible role for consciousness in the physical world via the process of quantum measurement, where at least some great physicists like Eugene Wigner speculated that consciousness plays a central role in observation which affects the physical world. And that's at least one strategy for the contemporary, uh, for the contemporary dualist. But I guess dualism has been on the, uh, somewhat on the back foot in this area. That said, there's been actually quite a lot then of recent attention to non-dualist approaches, which I know are, are uh, central in the uh, Advaita tradition. Uh, you know, the idea there might be an underlying monism between this, uh, but behind this, uh, behind this dualism, whether a monism of consciousness 
at grounds of at the ground of both the physical and the mental world, or maybe something else. Neutral monism says maybe it's something more basic at the grounds of all this. But yeah, I love your idea of it from chit. This would be a uh, this is a statement of a kind of the uh, idealist view that consciousness is all that's fundamental in reality. And yeah, we could even combine it with the it from bit view, where we say ah, oh, those bits are themselves grounded in in consciousness in chit right. and then we'd have the it from bit from chit view yes. which, is, which, which is a view i think that could be very much worth worth attention i i'm going to go deeper into this in a moment i'm going to ask you about uh, the possibility of distinguishing mind from consciousness this is an angle which is well known in indian philosophy not just in advaita and i think it might be a way forward at least in the philosophy of mind i don't know about the science of it um and also I'll ask you about the oneness of, uh, of consciousness. But before that, let's get something out of the way. The, the really big, the elephant in the room, if you will, is materialism, reductionism. That uh, right now, the materialist view of a uh, scientific view is dominant, that everything has to be grounded in matter or energy, you know, even biology is nothing but chemistry, chemistry is nothing but physics, and physics is ultimately um, in little bits of matter and or, or energy. And um, every week, every other week, you will have a uh, new article, some scientific, some popular, consciousness solved, the mystery of consciousness solved, they reduce it to something or the other. And they call it promissory materialism that give us 30, 40 years, and we will explain consciousness to your satisfaction. Uh, from the perspective of uh, just brain or, or um, you know, or maybe quantum mechanics or something like that. Uh, what's your view of this and the prospects along this line? Well, I think materialism is a beautiful and powerful view of reality. I, for a long time, I considered myself a materialist. It seemed in many ways to be the natural view suggested by modern science, where so much gets explained in terms of physical processes, as you say, biology in terms of chemistry, chemistry in terms of physics. Uh, we have this picture of the physical world that it seems can explain so much. So it's a simple and scientifically powerful view. I ultimately just came to the view that, unfortunately, materialism founders when it comes precisely to the problem of consciousness. Consciousness is something distinct that raises special issues. and. You know, materialism is great for solving what I call the easy problems of consciousness, potentially explaining aspects of objective human behavior. But when it comes to subjective experience, all of our paradigms for materialist explanations seem to fail. Maybe we can find correlations between what's in the brain and consciousness, but correlation is not explanation. And yeah, some people say, okay, this is just a temporary problem will solve the problem eventually. And while I respect the humility uh, in that view, I came to think, okay, no, the problem here is systematic. There are just certain limits on what you're going to get from purely physical explanations of reality, and they won't ultimately address the hard problem. So I, been, I ended up saying, okay, well, materialism, although very attractive, is false. The data, if you like, the data of consciousness force us to reject it. And that then can lead you to could lead you to dualism, maybe it can lead you to idealism and to other views. But my view is ultimately, yeah, taking the data of consciousness seriously requires rejecting materialism. Now, of course, that's controversial. And some materialists come back and say, what is this thing, consciousness? It doesn't even exist. Others try to be more ecumenical and say, yeah, well, consciousness does exist, but we can explain it. Or some will say, well, okay, we haven't explained it yet, but we eventually will explain it and you know i think we all should have some humility about what we're going maybe there'll be new amazing crazy ideas out there for a materialist solution to consciousness but in the meantime i've been you know pursuing i think there's a lot to be said for pursuing other views even in light of contemporary science um you know non-reductionism in science can be quite compatible i think i uh, i agree with you entirely swami vivekananda said actually uh, he says, in a certain sense, I'm also a materialist. I think that there is only one reality at the end of it all, and I call it spirit, you call it matter. But until we come to that one reality, I think it's important to keep forcing the issue and uh, take a stand on. Um, 
Now, I want to introduce something which has not been um, discussed uh, or at least highlighted uh, in the present discussions in the philosophy of mind. That is the distinction between mind and consciousness. Note mm. how we were talking just now, we distinguished between bit and consciousness. Um, so, uh, so, for example, if you take the data of consciousness itself, Advaita Vedanta would say, notice how when we say it feels like something, what that something is, it keeps changing. So, so for example, uh, you know, the experience of a red rose is different from the experience of uh, the taste of coffee. So the rose and the coffee are different and the experiences are different. But one notice one thing constant between them that it still feels like the something keeps changing, but the feels like. And the advantage of the split would be in that case, mind would be that would be the content of consciousness and it would keep changing with every experience. And that would also explain why conscious experience, which is now a compound of uh, the content and consciousness itself, uh, it would also explain why conscious experience seems to correlate so closely with brain, um, you know, brain activity. Uh, according to Advaita or most Indian, in fact, all Indian philosophies, mind is also a kind of matter. I and mean, that's surprising to many people, but mind is a, the, the two kinds of matter, physical matter or gross matter and subtle matter. Subtle matter is what we experience as objects in consciousness directly. In that case, the interaction between uh, mind and brain would not be such a problem in principle because both would be kinds of matter and uh, consciousness would be in fact in that case something uh, distinct and the question people ask is a reductionist would ask show me one thing that this consciousness of yours does and we could immediately say it, it does it gives everybody the feeling of it feels like something uh, that uh, yeah so what's your take on this? Would, would, would you agree to, or would you, what do you think of consciousness being independent of mind and giving rise to conscious experiences? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I think you know, people use these words, mind and consciousness in so many different ways. And some people say, well, there can be mind, mental states, which are conscious and others, which are, uh, which are unconscious and so on. But I think, the distinction that you're focusing on here. Yeah, people sometimes, I, I kind of think of consciousness as having two poles, if you like. There's the contents of consciousness, you know, what you're aware of. And there's like what you might think of as awareness itself, the relation by which you become aware of these contents. Some people talk about the contents and the screen that, yeah. the, uh, that the contents are, uh, are displayed on. So on. maybe that's another way of getting at the idea but yeah i think of it as well there's all consciousness involves awareness and certainly and the consciousness that we're most used to involves awareness of some contents yes um so maybe those contents are what you're calling mind and the awareness is what you're calling consciousness right yeah the question that arises can there be awareness without content and i know there's a uh, huge explorations of this in the uh in the Eastern, in the Eastern tradition, but yeah, but I think that distinction. I mean, some contemporary philosophers talk about the distinction between qualitative character, which is the contents, and uh, maybe subjective character, which is the awareness. Right. And I think that's an important distinction. Uh, yes, in fact, in ancient Indian philosophy of mind, there were a number of questions which were discussed. One of those questions was. Uh, does consciousness always come with contents or can there be a contentless uh, consciousness in Sanskrit Savishaya and Nirvishaya Jnana and there was the this uh, uh, modern German philosopher uh, Husserl uh, who talked about the intentionality of uh, uh, consciousness so the possibility at least of non-intentional uh, consciousness uh, the, the, just like I give the example of light through the darkness of space. It just looks dark, but there's light there. You just need an object for it to reflect off. And then you have the experience of illumination. Um, the object is illuminated by light, but light is also revealed by the object. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't see the light itself. Um, let me go a little further than this. If we can abstract consciousness uh, from mind or mind from consciousness, um, would it, what would you say to the possibility of a singular consciousness? You know, instead of trying to divide consciousness into many experiences, many beings, 
I mean, now we are moving from uh, different, you know, philosophical perspectives. The Sankhyan would say that there are multiple consciousnesses, whereas the non-dualist, the Advaitin, which is sort of my home tradition, it says that the difference lies in the objects of consciousness, but in consciousness itself, there's no, no distinction. I'm very much open to this idea that, yeah, the, I mean, obviously there are phenomenological distinctions between different conscious states. Feeling pain is totally different from seeing red, which is different again from thinking about your hometown. They're all conscious states. So yeah, one view says, uh, these are ultimately differences in the content. In one case, you're aware of a pain. In one case, you're aware of redness. In the other in one case, you're aware somehow of your town. And I think that's at least consistent with the idea that the awareness relation is the same in each of these cases. And it's just the content that changes. Now, there are philosophical views that say there are multiple forms of awareness. For example, maybe I can see red, but I can also think about red, and those are different conscious states. Some people would say those are different conscious states with the same content, and therefore the difference arises at least in the mode of awareness. So I don't know whether your view would allow, for example, different modes of awareness, but still one kind of awareness that that undergirds it all? Well, for example, it would talk about the same red as the object, but there are different modes. So you can have a perceptual mode where I see the uh, red, and I could, be, I could think about the red, but mm -hmm. behind it all would be one uniform awareness, which just gives you the first person experience of either seeing mm -hmm. or thinking about it. Um, yes, now that's really very interesting. I, I was just thinking, uh, you know, let me give you what, what most people, technical philosophers and uh, the layman would c consider, like you said, the master argument, you know, uh, for uh, master argument for reductionism, uh, for, you know, the, the, that materialism is right. So we have here in the Vedanta Society, our senior most member, Bill Conrad, who is a retired uh, biophysicist, and his master argument against uh, what we have been talking about now is that, Swami, it's not true that consciousness is the underlying reality. For example, we could both leave this room and keep a camera on in this room, and there would be no conscious beings in this room. We'd leave it. We come back again and see the pictures in the camera, and the camera would show an empty room happily existing without any kind of consciousness. It's not true that you know physical reality is an, just an appearance in consciousness. It exists outside uh, of consciousness. This is one of the criterion of reality, which you uh, put forward. Now, my argument there was this distinction in Advaita Vedanta between, the, between consciousness and knowing. And so the argument goes like this. I said to him, Bill, um, in your consciousness, you thought of this exper ex experiment. In your consciousness, we set up uh, this camera. In your consciousness, we left the room. In your consciousness, we come back into the room. In your consciousness, we see the pictures of an empty room and come to the conclusion, room existed without consciousness. Where did you step outside consciousness at any point? And uh, so what would you think of that argument? Ah, that's interesting. And I'm very sympathetic, actually, with, with this, uh, the basic argument against idealism. Yeah, idealism being the view that uh, consciousness is all of reality. I mean, one extreme form of of idealism says my consciousness is all of reality and then i start to yeah i very much moved by this sort of problem i look away i come back and it's still there why is it still there oh well something had to, my consciousness changed but there was something there that was uh that was constant of course there's a there's a famous poem about this uh i think it's by the oxford academic ronald ronald knox which i quote in the uh in the book see if i can uh look it up here about uh it was an argument against Berkeley who thought that all of uh all of um all of reality is in the mind and he said this is the problem of the tree and the quad and he's in the form of two limericks there once was a man who said god must find it exceedingly odd if he finds that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad so he goes, well, no, when no one is in the room, somehow the tree is still there. How can that happen if 
if uh, reality is all in the mind. Uh, and then the reply is, dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad. And that's why the tree will continue to be, since observed by yours faithfully, God. God, yes. <laughs> that's a famous reply. Uh, but and, uh, you know, if you tweak that argument that um, uh, two consciousness appears, two kinds of things, knowing and not knowing. So for example, in a dream, we get the sense of inhabiting a world uh, in which we are uh, knowing a slice of that world. I can see people and I can interact with some people and I have a vague idea of an entire vast unknown world all around me. But when I wake up the whole thing, the known slice of that world and the entire so-called unknown world mm. would still be a dreamt world in the whole thing. And exactly like that in the waking state, we have slices of aware of knowledge and a vast unknown all around us. But the whole thing as known and unknown, both being still in consciousness. I mean, you can't step out of uh, consciousness at any point. Maybe there's an argument that there has to be something at least I mean, I would normally think of this as an argument that has to be something at least beyond my consciousness. Yes. To explain why the tree is still there, it has to be something beyond my consciousness. Maybe it's your consciousness. Maybe it's God's consciousness. Maybe it's a physical world. But there has to be something beyond my consciousness. But I guess another view is that, hey, well, maybe my consciousness is bigger than what I know to bring in the distinction with knowledge. Right. And then, then I guess I would just say, okay, well, now there has to be something beyond let's call it my known consciousness, the aspects of my consciousness that I am aware of. And instead of saying the extra part is God's consciousness, maybe you could say the extra part is an aspect of my consciousness that I don't know about. And that's what's underlying underlying all this. And I don't know which of these would be uh, closer I, to the... Uh, I think the Advaita view is, is exactly why this, the same uh, argument they have against the subjective idealists, which in the Advaita case where the, uh, the Buddhists uh, so uh, I think that in the Advaita view, uh, it would be uh, they, um, they in fact argued very strongly against the subjective idealists who were the Buddhist philosophers about 14, 1500 years ago, uh, who seemed to be saying exactly what Berkeley, uh, Berkeley was, was saying. And the Advaitins did not agree with them. That was surprising because they seem to be saying similar things, that things are in consciousness. And the Advaitins said, no, it's not my consciousness. It's not, the world is not an imagination in, in your mind the way a dream might be an imagination in your mind. So the world does exist apart from your mind. But then they talked about a global consciousness in which all minds were appearing and you know, known as the unknown. And that's fascinating. Um, let me see. A chat because we had promised our audience here. If you're okay, should we could we go to the questions in the chat? I think we're just about ten minutes. Sure. Left. There is Alpana Chatterjee who's saying, "Professor, how would you define consciousness?" So that's a global question. <laughs> yeah, that's such a, yeah, such a big question. But I always it's hard to you know define these give definitions for these big philosophical terms. But I always like an expression that my colleague Tom Nagel who Swami mentioned, used, which is, you know, is there something it's like to be a bat? What is it like to be a bat? We don't know whether a bat, what a bat's consciousness is like, but we know, we think there's something it's like to be a bat. So we can say now a being is conscious if there's something it's like to be that being. Maybe there's something it's like to be me. Maybe there's nothing it's like to be this cup. So conscious, you're conscious if there's something it's like to be you. And your conscious state is what it is like to be you at a given time. Maybe that, that conception of consciousness is as good as any, at least as a starting point. That was another central paper in the philosophy of mind. What is it like to be a bat? Thomas Nagel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if I could give the Advaitic definition of consciousness, it's a sort of negative definition. It says consciousness is, defines this as not this. So whatever you can designate as this in your experience, you know, this table, this hand, this thought, that's not consciousness. That's, uh, that's all appearing to consciousness. So it's sort of in the indirect way of pointing back towards consciousness. Here is Rekha Kalikar. Uh, she's asking, Professor, isn't consciousness that which enables one to become aware of the physical and virtual reality? If that's the case, 
And how can physical and virtual reality be apart from consciousness? Um, this, yeah, so it's, if, if you're aware of physical reality and virtual reality, in fact, everything is, you're aware of them in consciousness, and there's no way you can step outside consciousness, you know, to see them separately. You can't, I mean, let's put it this way. If whatever we are aware of, it's always in consciousness and you can't separate the two, uh, then doesn't this point to everything being sort of uh, in consciousness or they don't exist apart from consciousness? Yeah, it's interesting. But, um, you know, you yourself have been making this distinction between awareness, consciousness and the contents of yeah. consciousness. And to me, that at least leaves open the idea, OK, maybe the contents of consciousness are just part of consciousness, but hey, they could be something distinct from consciousness that consciousness makes you aware of. And um, I'm at least, you know, I think some dualist, for example, would say, well, yeah, there is a mental world of consciousness. There's a physical world that's not a world of consciousness, but consciousness is like this relation, this arrow, this ray that make, that gives us and enab enables us to become aware of something outside itself. I have to confess, I quite like this view of consciousness <laughs> as a way of something. It's a way of knowing something outside itself. It could be that all we're knowing is just more consciousness. I'm open to that uh, to that idea, but I quite like the idea that there's something outside of consciousness that we actually become aware of through consciousness. Um. That just reminded me about something being external to consciousness, which we become aware of through consciousness. One argument, and this I get again from Bill, who is, by the way, 98 this year. Uh, he says that the very complexity revealed by science shows that things revealed by science cannot be consciousness. They must be objects revealed by consciousness. Would complexity be an argument for an external existence? I mean, conscious states can themselves be complex. I agree there's a lot of complexity in the world. I mean, the universe has been revealed to us as enormous, as complex, involving levels of complexity that, again, seem to go far beyond what I find in my own consciousness. So that, to me, is another argument that there needs to be something beyond my consciousness, or at least beyond the aspects of my consciousness that I know about. Um, I think we've got good reason to believe in yeah, the, the processes that physics postulates, for example, the enormous complexity of the physical world. It's possible that all that could be grounded in consciousness, though. I mean, on, on the it from bit from chit view, you know, maybe all this is going to be grounded in information which is itself grounded in consciousness. Consciousness can be can be complex, or it could be, or it could be grounded in something other. Than consciousness, I think both of those are possible, but I don't see that. Uh, um, you know, if you're inclined to think that consciousness has to be utterly simple, then I suppose there's a question of how it can generate that complexity. But right. on my view, consciousness can be complex. And just to add to that, uh, the ancient Indian theories of consciousness, even though I, I mean, so that pe people don't have this wrong idea that it's only one Advaitic theory, was a whole range of thinkers from the materialist Charvaka who thought um, consciousness was just a product of bodily processes, uh, a theory I think that would uh, warm the heart of Daniel Dennett, uh, to the uh, Nyaya Vaisheshika view, which thought of you know, the reality as being very diverse, plural, with substances and, and qualities and uh, actions, and uh, consciousness just being a, a property of a substance called mind, for example. Uh, then you had the Sankhyan view, which put everything uh, into nature, material nature, and abstracted consciousness out. So we had a dualism of consciousness and nature. And then finally, and then the Buddhist views. And there are multiple schools of Buddhists, some of which were direct realists, saying that we know the world directly. Some were representative realists. Some were uh, subjective idealists. You mentioned Basu Bandhu, for example, in this book, who thought the world was a dream in the mind. It's all in the mind, in the, in the stream of mental consciousness. Um, or they were skeptical about uh, uh, knowledge itself, like Nagarjuna, whom you mentioned again in, in this book, in Reality Plus. And then there were the Advaitins who thought of consciousness as uh, fundamental. So a whole range and many other views, like the Tantric view, the Kashmir Shaiva view of consciousness as a vibrating reality producing its own objects and so on. Uh, I must mention Professor Arindam Chakravarti, who you know, mm -hmm. uh, he had coined this beautiful thing recently, he, he said, uh, 
an object is something that objects to my consciousness. So anything that object like your consciousness runs up against something that resists your consciousness is an object to consciousness. Um, all right, let's go on. Rajendra is asking, is the world an appearance in consciousness or a manifestation of consciousness? And do you see a distinction? That's interesting. I mean, three possibilities. I mean, if you're a subjective idealist, maybe you say all there is to the physical world is in its appearance in my consciousness. Or maybe if you think the world could be an appearance in God's consciousness or in the universal consciousness. Um, it could be, I guess, the manifestation of consciousness is like consciousness is what's basic and it forms itself into the world. Um, I think either way, consciousness is, is would be fundamental, but yeah, the story is either consciousness represents the world, it pictures the world, or it kind of, it forms the world. Maybe those are two, I, in an article I wrote on idealism, I distinguish between what I call anti-realist idealism, where the physical world is just a representation, it's just represented in consciousness, it's just an appearance. And realist idealism that says, no, consciousness actually forms itself into the world. Maybe that would be more like the manifestation view. So both of those are available. There's also the third view, which I was indicating some interest in, that the world is actually something outside consciousness that consciousness can come to know. But I think all three of those are possibilities. But I guess I'm especially sympathetic with some of these realist forms of idealism where the world is in a way a manifestation of consciousness appropriately formed and configured. Partha asks Professor Chalmers, what impels so many of us to reduce consciousness to brain or mind or even ignore it completely? And it's a good question. I mean, you know, Daniel Dennett, uh, you know him personally for a long time. Um, so um, what's that perspective? Is, is it simply the, the prestige uh, and the dominant worldview of uh, material science? Is that it or is there something else? I think, you know, I take materialism very Seriously, it's a view that has a lot of power, a lot of science, a lot of explanation behind it. So there's a, you know, you wouldn't want to reject the materialist worldview without very good reasons. And uh, I think ultimately consciousness does provide a good reason. But I understand people that think, uh, you know, materialism is the view that's that we ought to take most seriously because of its support by science. But some people do that in a thinking, reflective way. Daniel Dennett certainly does that. He's very reflective about it. And he realizes that he has to take very strong views, take a very strong and rather extreme view to reject consciousness. He ends up saying it's a kind of illusion. And I at least respect that because that's a kind of materialism that pays the price you know, of, of being a materialist. You have to say consciousness is an illusion to be a materialist. And I, that's not a bullet I can bite, but I respect paying the price here. Other people... As uh, yeah, as Partha mentions, based, don't so much reflect on it, but just ignore it completely. And I think that maybe that's easy. I mean, you were saying before how it's easy to look. Consciousness makes you aware of contents. Maybe some people just pay attention to contents and right. miss the consciousness. It's not. Yeah. It's not always introspectively apparent. The philosopher G. E. Moore said consciousness, the thing itself, is transparent or diaphanous. You look straight through consciousness. To the world and it takes some attention to pay attention to consciousness as people in this tradition will know absolutely i mean uh you mentioned more and i can't resist asking you this so we are totally out of time but i mean i read that the the diaphanous the transparent nature of consciousness you know what struck me immediately from an advaitic perspective is look you are treating consciousness as an object and that's why it when you pay attention to it, you think it's now like a transparent object, but it's not an object at all. You're not looking through consciousness. It's consciousness which is looking. Consciousness can never become an object. And just by the way, because I've got you here, I just wanted to ask your opinion about Moore's you know, two hands, the, the little paper which is supposed to have disposed of subjective idealism in the 20th, 20th century. Um, I see this, I raise one hand and uh, then this is the other hand and therefore um, you know, th there is an external world. Uh, it, it seemed to me that paper was, uh, it didn't really do away with subjective idealism in, from my perspective. Do you, you know, the paper I'm talking about? Sure, 
Of course, yeah, very Africa. famous. Uh, yeah, this was his proof that there is an external world. He said, well, here is one hand, here is another. Therefore, the external world exists. Actually, in the book, I have a little, uh, little cartoon illustration of this that shows a brain in a vat going through this process. It's just yes. a brain floating in a vat, but it thinks here is one hand, here is another. Therefore, the external world exists. I think, you know, that's a way of suggesting I think most people are a bit, most philosophers are a bit skeptical about Moore's argument. It's really an argument from common sense right? Uh, to a certain view of external reality. But uh, yeah, I mean, common sense is important, but I think we need to be aware of, I think we need to be open to the idea that reality may be stranger than we thought. And, uh, you know, some bits of common sense we'll hold on to, other bits we will... Uh, we will discard. So um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, Moore is a great philosopher of the common sense tradition. I find myself not so sympathetic with the common sense tradition. Right. Um, I know we have gone well over time now, with, uh, but I just ask this, um, Professor Bose is asking, uh, Professor Chalmers, what is your opinion about the conception of subtle matter as opposed to gross matter as brought up by Swamiji. And what I meant there, I think what he also means is, would it take a revolution in, say, physics, maybe quantum physics, a discovery of a new form of matter, uh, which would uh, make maybe mind also, uh, you know, like you could explain the contents of consciousness, for example. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but you have mentioned in different ways in this book, like the, the idea of it being based on consciousness. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are very, there are interesting views about what is actually the nature of matter. And, you know, some people think the nature of matter itself involves consciousness. Like underlying all of physics is some fundamental states of consciousness. I don't know whether that might count then as consciousness being subtle matter the underlying matter. But another idea I'm open to is there might be something possibly more fundamental than both consciousness and matter. I call this X. You know, <laughs> X is the thing. It gives you consciousness and it gives you matter and it underlies both. That would be a form of monism of this unknown thing, X. I talk about the it from bit from X view in, <laughs> right. the, uh, in the book. And then I think that would also be a I take it that whatever X is, maybe then we could think of this as a subtle materialism, a subtle matter of X. So maybe there's the, yeah, there's it from consciousness. Consciousness could be the subtle matter, but maybe there's also this new neutral thing X that underlies both consciousness and matter. Both of those would be non-dual views. Excellent. I was just going to ask you Kalyan Basu's question as the last question, but I think you've already answered it. Uh, he asks, is information or bit is it fundamental or is it approximation of, of measurements by limit? I think you just answered it, that it's clearly it is limited and there could be something more fundamental than, uh, than, than bit. I think there is a view, which I find very interesting, what I call the pure it from bit view, where the bits themselves are fundamental and nothing underlies those bits. It's just pure like zero or one, pure difference. But I'm actually more sympathetic with the view that the bits are not fundamental Maybe it's it from bit from consciousness. Consciousness underlies the bits. Maybe it's it from bit from X. Something else underlies the bits. Maybe right. it's it from bit from chit. It okay. turns out, yeah, all of these ideas, all of these views have been explored one way or the other in these ancient traditions. And I'm just fascinated how many times you find, you know, you find ancient versions of these views and, and, then, their, uh, and then their modern developments. And yeah, I've learned a lot just from in, in this session from... Uh, from seeing how these issues arise in so many traditions. I, I don't want to let you go, but I have to, we have run out of time, but for everybody watching, and this is going to go on YouTube and a lot, lot more people are going to watch. Uh, so that was David Chalmers uh, on Reality Plus. I strongly recommend this book if you're interested in Advaita Vedanta, in Buddhism, if you're interested in the philosophy of mind, if you love Matrix, the movie, uh, which is there prominently <laughs> in this book also. <laughs> Um, Diane? Yes, I, I, I want to join by saying whatever reality we are in, um, you are leaving us wanting more. And I do hope there will be another, another talk in the very near future, Professor. And 
I wish you, and on behalf of everybody, the very best for this new book of yours and much success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Namaste to Professor and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thanks so much to all of you. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.